Do you guys have any questions for me? I have right. one question. It's the pectoral is minor and um, mm -hmm. it's asthma. Like I have asthma and I've always helped. It's like helped a lot when I learned how to release that. And I wondered if you had any tips for releasing it that weren't so painful in some people, basically. Like I know how to do it in me, but especially in guys, you know? They get it's, really tight. Mm -hmm. Or if you had any comments, I just like, I found something, I thought it was neato how that muscle influenced my asthma and that was. Yes, petrolis minor, right? You guys know it's kind of this muscle here, right? And we talked about its angle downward and its insertion points are where? Do you guys remember? Right on our, right on our ribs. Yes, right into the rib cage, basically. So even if you don't remember which ribs, you know that it's going right into the rib cage. Yeah, let me just, uh, let me share screen. We'll, we'll look at a picture because this is really relevant. Pec minor, take a look, right? So it's inserting into third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib. Yeah. What happens when we breathe? We have to expand the rib cage exactly, right? So we're expanding the rib cage. Now imagine, so remember we talked a lot about muscle fiber direction. Muscle fiber direction and is going to determine the direction of contracture or lengthening or strength or, or strength, right? Or pull. And so this is the direction it's gonna go in when we have to use pec minor, right? We're gonna shorten in this direction. It's also the direction it's going to go when we're tight. Uh, I, I pointed this direction, right? It's gonna go that way. Or you can think of it as shortening in this direction, which would do what to your shoulder area? Right, exactly. It's gonna pull it mm -hmm, right forward, exactly. So it's pulling that all right forward. Okay, so we know that that's already bad. This is why we talk about pec minor so much in posture. But if now we're talking about asthma, we're talking about irritation of the lungs, basically. And what happens for somebody who has asthma is it's more difficult to get enough oxygen in. And so what they tend to do, when, especially when asthma is active, is use accessory muscles of breathing, right? Accessory muscles of breathing are all the muscles around the chest wall that are not the diaphragm that actually help lift up the rib cage and allow room for the lungs to expand, right? And it can go all the way up to the neck. It can go all the way to upper traps because we've got that first rib way up there we talked about, right? So all of that, these, so pec minor essentially becomes an accessory muscle of breathing. And so if pec minor is tight, it's a lot harder to move the ribs. So if we go in and we release the rib cage, especially these upper, right? Three, four, three, four, five. So if we go in and release pec minor, we create reverse, uh, we create some relaxation around the rib cage, calming of that area and ability to expand and contract the rib cage a little bit more with a little more ease. And, and flip of that, somebody with asthma may have a super tight pec minor because they're constantly shortening and lifting that rib cage up to try and get more air into the lungs, right? To try and expand the rib cage. Now, what do we do about it? That's the question, yeah? So opening it up definitely would help. How do we open it up in a non-painful way? I think, you know, one of the things that I try and think about when I'm trying to create less pain for somebody, I try and think of the opposing muscles, right? So there's one, one way to attack a tight muscle is to stretch that muscle directly. The other way to loosen a tight muscle is to activate the muscles that are opposing it, right? Because if I activate the muscle, you can think about that in your hamstrings or your, and your, versus your quads, or you could think about that in your biceps versus your triceps, right? I can use the opposing group of muscles to stretch or keep or maintain the length that I've achieved in the tight muscle. Yep, so one way that you might go about is not just thinking about, I have to stretch that all the time. I could think about if I shortened the muscles on the other side of my coracoid process in this case, right? Which is gonna be the scapula is the coracoid process. So now we're thinking, oh, scapula. All right, if I then want to pull coracoid process backwards, I'm gonna turn my person around here. Right, so now I am gonna try and pull coracoid process, which is down here, 
backwards, what muscles am I going to use to do that? Mm -hmm. Rhomboids is one, exactly. I can use lats is another. I can use lower trapezius, middle trapezius, lower trapezius is another. And so what fantastic Pilates exercise that's all over on all the apparatus do we do that does all that? Rowing, right? Back rowing, chest expansion, if you do it well, chest expansion if you do it wrong is terrible, right? Yeah, a lot, a lot pulling down our chicken wings actually. So all of that opens, puts on stretch, but it also activates um, the scapular region, right? So activates all those muscles that are gonna come in to help the scapula come back um, and come down. So, and also serratus posterior, which is way down here. Uh, and the posterior inferior we have and posterior superior we have down here. Um, we can look at those again in more detail. I'm trying to think if I even have them in this module or if you remember back to that thoracic module, we saw some of those there too. Um, but all of those that can help stabilize the scapula towards its, here's serratus anterior, we can see right here. Um, all the muscles that help stabilize our shoulder blades back and down are gonna help loosen the tight pec minor, so the, the anterior structure. So yeah, if, if you can think about that. Otherwise, um, if we're gonna dig in and we're gonna go on foam roller, which I think actually the, I find the more passive stretching sometimes in this case, if it's super tight and painful is actually better. So starting with a lower, like a pec major stretch, moving up just gently and maybe not going to an extreme. So, and, and if we're trying to create length and muscles, my advice is always hold it in a mild to moderate stretch, but hold it for three minutes, four minutes, long time in a, in a place where you're feeling like there's a little stretch happening, but not a huge one. So you're not uh, contracting and, and um, holding tension while you're trying to stretch, yeah? So longer hold times, extend the holds and, and go milder on the actual motion and then work the back body or the opposing group. And again, that's true anywhere in the body, I think. So yeah, great question. All right, any others? Yeah. You're very welcome. Just on that topic of holding the stretch, um, the, what, what's I'm trying to say, it, it's what, happens when do, are you getting a resistance rebound from the muscles stretch stretch reflex that wants to rebound and tighten back up is that what happens at when it's too intense at end range yeah yes so that's you know it, lane you're you're old enough to remember i'm old enough to remember some of you may not be old enough to remember but um jane fonda days right and jack What's the name? Jack, Jack, Jack Lelaine. Lelaine, Jack thank you. Jack Lelaine, right? All they were all about that ballistic stretching, right? Huh, huh, I'm gonna stretch my hamstring. <laughs> right. There were so many injuries in that phase. I mean, good on them. They got people stretching. Hey, I gotta say that was that was a big deal at that time. But guess how many hamstrings they tore? It was I should have been a physical therapist then. I would have made a ton of money on hamstring stretches, on hamstring strains. But um, so that ballistic stretching, which is that fast end range um, stretching, which you need if you're going to be doing activities that have that, right? But you don't need if you're sitting at a desk all day, right? Um, and you don't want to start there, right? That's because, that's because we put those muscle fibers under so much tension so quickly. It's a quick stretch. And what happens with our body if the body is not prepared for that quick stretch, it grabs and holds, right? So it, it says, uh oh, gotta protect, boom. And so you actually end up sometimes tighter than it's your body's response to, oh my gosh, I'm gonna break, I'm gonna break, right? So it holds tighter to, and so that's when you get that rebound tightness after. So there is a time and a place for ballistic stretching. It's when you're gonna use that in function. It's when your body's already heated and warmed up. Like it has to be a really progressive movement into ballistic stretching. But, um, but yeah, so the, the research actually on stretching shows that 
need to for more than 20 seconds to maintain length. So usually advice is tw for 20 seconds is like minimum. So you hold for 20 seconds, maintain the length you have. If you want to increase length, you have to hold for, I think it was between 30 seconds and a minute to increase length in the muscle fibers. But nobody, if you tell them to hold for 20 seconds, they're not holding for 20 seconds. And most of the time when we're asking people to stretch, we're, at, we're, we're looking for a change. If we're looking for change, then we need to hold longer than that time period. So I would say bump to a minute or so. If it's a sensitive area or you feel like they really need to let go because um, they're tense and holding, then you want to lengthen that time even more. So my homework to my clients in this sort of situation are go hang out on that roller, make it a mild stretch and sit there for five minutes. Just if you just spend five minutes in a stretch on the roller in a comfortable position, that's going to serve them so much better because then they're going to hold that change, that length, right? And when the stretches are nice and long. Maybe more information than you wanted, but there you have it.